Welcome to episode 307 of Cinematary. I'm your host, Zach Dennis, and I'm here with... Andrew Swafford. Miranda Barnwell. And today joining us is our guest, Chad Newsom. Chad, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> we're going to have to, we're going to figure out this mic situation. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Well, we have, uh, as usual, we have movies that we saw this week in part one. And in part two, we'll be continuing our Young Critics Watch Old Movies series, 1959's Imitation of Life. Um, but before we do that, let's go ahead uh, real quickly and do a quick plug for Cinematary.com. Uh, Andrew, give us an idea of some of the stuff that we have recently. I read off some stuff last week, but I know we have a lot of yeah. stuff coming. We got two uh, pretty big publications this week. We usually just stick to the one on every Monday. But uh, today we posted, or I guess today, the day we're recording this, Wednesday, we posted a new canon list, our 14th one of those. It's called Best Non-Movies of 2020. Um, and the basic idea behind that is that we haven't gotten a lot of new movies this year, so we took an opportunity at the midpoint of the year to commemorate the things that are not movies that we have been enjoying so a rare opportunity to see us writing about things that are not cinema uh there's some some fun inclusions in there uh like uh, some yoga videos and uh wrestlemania and uh there's a video essay about hangman that's really funny i wrote about the uh Alex Jones uh, viral video of him talking about how he was going to eat his neighbors um, the disco remix of that so go check that out um, also I published on Monday a full length review of Lynn manuel Miranda's Hamilton film that got put on Disney Plus over the holiday weekend and uh, I'm. I guess we're gonna jump right into that, right, Zach? Okay. Yeah, that's a perfect transition into part one. So I, I won't dwell on this too long, even though I know this is the movie of the moment. It's the movie everybody's talking about right now. But if you want to hear my full thoughts on this movie performance, etc., um, go to cinemashare.com, read my review. Um, my basic approach to that was I wanted to look at Hamilton from a couple of different angles because it's kind of a complicated object. It is a staged performance that's being live captured. Um, so on, on one level, it's it's not truly a film. It's like you're getting an opportunity to experience just this, the stage performance for the, uh, the original cast that is no longer accessible to anybody, especially not now with Broadway closed and everything. Uh, but it also functions as a movie uh, because you are watching it on a movie streaming service. It does utilize the camera a whole lot more um, than you might expect it would. It's not like you know somebody filming their, their, their kids like dance recital or something, just like stick in a camera somewhere in the audience the camera's up on stage moving around and emphasizing things and and doing some interesting editing here and there um so i, I analyzed it as a film as well um and then in the last like longer stretch um of the essay uh, as you might expect i kind of gave it an assessment as a political project because one of the big things that people tend to love about Hamilton is like the way it engages with American history, the way that it interpolates our sense of patriotism and and uh, like superimposes like this um um uh what's what's the word um when something is out of place in time anachronistic this anachronistic racial casting of the founding fathers so i i kind of tried to unpack what i thought it was attempting to say about uh, america or about the founding fathers um and also kind of superimposed that on top of what i was able to learn about the history from doing some googling uh, and how that history d does and does not match up uh with what is in the play um and also uh, did did some work comparing you know, the story that we're telling about America in Hamilton to the story we're telling about America in the Obama era, which is when Hamilton came out. And, uh, you know, the short version of my, my take there is that politics are iffy at best. I mean, it's very um, congratulatory. It feels very like racism is over. You know, we uh, it, it's 
definitely came out at a time where I think the the public consensus was like representation was like the number one thing that we were fighting for, or a lot of liberals were fighting for, anyways. And uh, Miriam Bale retweeted something, or maybe even maybe it was her tweet. I'm not sure. She said like Hamilton comes from a time when re- representation felt like enough. Um, but in in creating this like new uh, like diverse uh, d- diverse version of the founding father story we're having to really skirt around a lot of the the <laughs> extremely problematic things uh, the founding fathers were engaged in uh, not least of which Alexander Hamilton himself which uh, the play at various points tries to gesture towards Alexander Hamilton being an abolitionist which uh, from the, the very basic research I did, does not seem to be the case uh, on any level. Um, so there, there are some, some very troubling aspects of the, the way this is engaging in history and kind of telling us this whitewashed conservative version of history. Um, and I, I'll leave it at that. I think that people should go check out the, the full substance of the review uh, for the nuance. But uh, basically... It's a it's a good musical in terms of the the craft of it. Uh, it's a surprisingly well put together movie for just being a you know live capture of a theatrical performance. Um, politics have not held up in 2020. Uh, this is maybe something that should have come out in in 2016 when it was actually shot. Sure. When um, who, the director has he or she directed other movies or is this the Thomas first thing? Thomas Kale is the director of this, um, which is kind of an interesting case of um, for auteurism, right? Because Lynn Manuel Mar- Lynn Manuel Miranda, whose name I will eventually be able to say without stumbling over it. Um, is very much the auteur of this. He he wrote the music, he wrote the lyrics, he directed the stage play, I think. Um, and it's just, it's his brainchild, right? But for whatever reason, he was not the person behind this live capture. Thomas Kale is, and looking on uh, Letterbox right now, it seems like Thomas Kale, his whole thing is being a live capture theatrical performance guy. Um, he did Grease Live in 2016, which uh, was when they, they performed Grease live for television, not for a theatrical audience. And I'm also seeing versions of Oliver Twist and Fiddler on the Roof on his uh, filmography, but uh, there's not a lot of details. Maybe these are upcoming projects. Um, one note thing I'm noticing is the Oliver Twist only has one cast member credited, and that cast member is Ice Cube, um, which is interesting. That sounds amazing. <laughs> Especially if you've been following Ice Cube's Twitter account the past couple of weeks. Some wild shit happening over there. Um, but yeah, that's Hamilton. Um, go check out the review. Uh, watch for yourself on Disney Plus. See what you think. Um, yeah. Okay. I won't, but you know, good job on your on your <laughs> on your review. Uh, <laughs> well, cool. We I wanted to uh, to circle back to a movie that actually was recently released on. It's been out there, but it re- was recently released on the Criterion Channel as part of Pride Month, and that is. But I'm a cheerleader. Um, I think we've talked about this before on the podcast. Uh, I don't think we have, but we should have. Okay, I'm glad we're rectifying this now. Perfect. Um, that came out. It came out in 1999. Jamie Babbitt directed it. It stars Natasha Lyonne, uh, Clea Duvall, um, RuPaul. Before we knew that uh, RuPaul was a fracking monster. Um, Melanie Linsky. Uh, <laughs> really, all you're going to know about But I'm a Cheerleader is that Natasha Leone, who's the main character, her parents are played by Bud Court and Meek Stoll, which are unquestionably the best <laughs> cinematic parent pairing of all time. Um, I love that <laughs> so much. Um, but the, the crux of the story is uh, Natasha Leone plays a, uh, a all-American girl, a cheerleader, uh, named Megan, but Megan does not like kissing her boyfriend. Uh, <laughs> oh God! The shot, the shot of her kissing her boyfriend. I don't even know how to describe it. It's like her eyes are bugging out of her head. There's some weird things happening with tongues. Um, it's it's nuts. Yeah, absolutely. And then, um, but she, at the same time, she's she's uh, clearly very interested, like in the other cheerleaders around her. She has a picture of I don't think it's a specific person, but like a bikinied 
or you know a woman in her locker that uh, at one point her friend takes down um, and so one day she comes home from school and all of her friends and her boyfriend and her parents again played by Bud Court and Meek Stoll who f- fantastic casting again um, are like nope we're gonna send you to this uh, sexual redirection school which they, they drive out into what looks like the countryside of Tim Burton's mind and uh, <laughs> and she's dropped off with a number of other uh, kids there who are also going through this program to, I guess you know get the get the gay out um, is pretty much the the thesis of this uh, the school. It's not and a so- Christian um, conversion camp, weirdly, right? Like, isn't it like um, kind of a new agey psycho- psychological uh, bent? Um, but but obviously like really um like it's crackpot like non-science yeah it's closer to like the camp that julianne moore goes to in safe than a christian conversion camp if if in safe they made all the like little gay boys do like lumberjack exercises and shit like that (laughs) with uh with like baby blue t-shirts then yes (laughs) that's probably my and that's that's pretty much the gist of the plot that's my favorite part is is one um this Jamie Babbitt completely like hijacks uh, just kind of the Tim Burton aesthetic, but I feel like utilizes it in a much more interesting way than Tim Burton ever has, where she, uh, where it's it's just kind of like weaponized as this as this co- completely easy delineation between the, not all, not only the boys and the girls, but like uh, <laughs> that you know between you you're gay or you're a lesbian. And it's like it, 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 and that's pretty much like the the whole um, basis of that entire of the entire house is that, um, you know, with these, it, it, again, it kind of uses the the you know the Tim Burton tearing down of the. Now this is I mean this comes it comes out in nineteen ninety nine but it kind of t- it I mean it utilizes that that method of of tearing down the kind of Reagan era conservatism, um, in a way that. Again, I think I think it's much more interesting how it utilizes just the the popping color, the uh, you know small moments of like some of kind of tiny surrealism. Um, it, it utilizes all of that in a way that's that's much more in service rather than being in service of just being different. It's being different, but also informing like the the overall like this is what I'm trying to say with this movie, which I found to be really interesting. It's taking taking that super reductive like gender essentialist blue bla- blue brain pink brain uh, thinking uh, and and putting it on the walls everywhere and and showing just how ridiculous it is like how they try to uh, aestheticize this like gender role that the the camp is forcing uh, the these kids into is just it comes across as absurd. Yeah. And I th- so I found that kind of interesting because I mean I I I like some of Tim Burton's stuff, but at the same time, like his style, it, it, it I don't really find his style to be saying much other than it's just kind of Tim Burton. You know, it's just like he's yeah. It's it's kind of like this is the cinema for weird kids. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of like with a Michael Bay movie. It's like it's just Michael Bay. You know, that's just kind of what he does. And so I, I found that to be really interesting that, that you know Jamie Bob or Babbitt used this to. Uh, you, you use this to kind of comment in that way. Um, overall, though, I really, I really enjoyed it. it. It's, it's kind of a movie that I feel like should be more of, you know, a like a t te- like a like a Saturday afternoon matinee staple. You know, we, we see movies like Clueless or more contemporarily like Mean Girls. Like I, I absolutely think that, but I'm a cheerleader should be in that in that canon. In that, yeah, in yeah. that canon of of kind of teen um of, of like teen comedies you know teens figuring out uh who they are but in kind of the just this because it kind of plays itself a little bit like an independent movie but it also feels like it it, it could absolutely like fit in that you know somewhat studio model um it just didn't fit in the studio model because it's dealing with material that you know i guess in 1999 the studio didn't want to to handle but um, I absolutely think it should be in like in that canon of movies. I mean, the the performances. It's, um, isn't it on Criterion Channel right now? Like, wouldn't it yes. be great if this movie got a Criterion release? Oh, absolutely. Um, and so uh, and so yeah, it's it's um, 
I, I, I'm I surprised that it's kind of as underseen as it is. I was looking through like the letterbox reviews and I swear that every other review is somebody going, where the hell has this movie been? This is amazing. Um, Cause it's a real, it's a really funny movie. Um, I think that like the kind of two main performances by Lata- Natasha Leone and especially Clea Duvall um, is really, is, is, is really sweet, really tender. They, and, and just kind of like you have Clea Duvall playing like this, um, it's, she, she's kind of like the, uh, <laughs> like the lesbian James Jean or something. Um, I kind of like her, I, I kind of like her cool guy. Like she almost needed like a, like a leather jacket or whatever. And she might wear one at, at one point, but, um, yeah, Andrew, what, what do you, uh, what are your thoughts on, on, but I'm a chiller Cause I know you're a big fan as well. Oh no. I mean, I just co-sign everything you said. Uh, I think it's extremely funny. Um, I think the performances are, are just delightfully wacky and over the top, especially like RuPaul's performance <laughs> as, as someone who's like very strongly trying to convince everyone around him that he's straight, uh, is very funny. Um, and one like little detail that I really appreciate about this movie and I think about every time uh, the, the title comes to mind is um, the opening credits are to the song Chick Habit, um, which y- people may recognize from Quentin Tarantino's Death Proof. So much more well utilized in But I'm a Cheerleader than in Death Proof. Um, it's, a gr- it's a great credit sequence. <laughs> Yeah, no, I would recommend I would recommend checking this one out. I think it's a, uh, I think it's a nice little hidden gem. And like I said, uh, uh, I'll reiterate. Like I definitely think that this should be as widely viewed by teenagers as like as the Cluelesses and you know the Mean Girls. And I think it's absolutely like in that canon. And probably, I think I, I honestly I think smarter than both of those movies. <laughs> So there were a couple, um, I think, was it a year ago or two years ago? Um, we had two different movies about conversion camps. There was The Miseducation of Cameron Post, and then there was, is it Boy Erased? Is that the name of that one? Um, and both of those were very um, heavy and serious. And it's a serious heavy topic for sure. And I could maybe see people taking against But I'm a Cheerleader for like, maybe making light of the subject matter but i don't think for a minute the the cruelty and the evil of this place leaves uh jamie babbitt's view i mean i think that this like satirizes with comedy um these institutions way more effectively than the the melodrama does in in the the more recent films well, and that's why, and that's where the whole like Tim Burton comparison comes into into focus because it uses it uses that to, it's making it, it's kind of making fun of the absurdity of these places, but also yeah, I agree. It never, it never, um, you know, kind of dulls down what is happening there. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty upfront, and it 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 does display a, a you know a decent amount of empathy for you know, all of the characters involved, including the, um, I forgot who the, the actress who plays the, the kind of head, head master of the, of the school, but even her and, and her son there, I mean, it, it, there's still this like degree of empathy for, there's really a degree of empathy for every character, except maybe uh, the parents of, uh, Natasha Leone's character played by Bud Court and Mink Stoll again for the third time. Also, this is a movie about gay characters that has a happy ending, which is actually, pretty rare um in in the canon of queer cinema so if if you're looking for something like that um then this is your movie for sure yeah it's uh so it, it's on the criterion channel now um I'm, it's not like completely unavailable I'm, I'm sure you can find it um in other streaming places it's on yeah. amazon too but yeah I, I hope it'll get kind of you know the criterion channel unfortunately is kind of a little bit of a uh a kind of niche service and so it would be nice to see this on something like Netflix or Hulu or even Amazon Prime where I would I would especially say like Netflix or Hulu where there are kids you know teenagers who are actively looking for LGBTQ plus like movies and television I mean you have something like on Hulu like that the Love Simon uh, spinoff series Love Victor and so it's like it's it's like I, you're so, I'm surprised that this hasn't found a home on like Hulu or Netflix where a lot of the the you know Gen Z kids who are are interested in that subject matter 
um, I feel like they would immediately jump on this movie as like, yeah, this is great. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, cool. Well, Andrew, you had one more movie you wanted to uh, talk about before we wrapped up? Yeah. Another Criterion Channel title. Um, this movie is called Black Mother by Kalika Law. Um, and I is this still available for free on the Criterion Channel? Criterion, um, when the, the George Floyd protest started, they put a large collection of their um, African-American and like African diaspora uh, cinema up for free which is how I watched like uh, Agnes Varda's Black Panthers and, and some stuff like that. Um, so this might, even if you don't have a Criterion Channel subscription, you might be able to go watch Black Mother I think for that's, free. I think that's, I think that's up now. Um, I, f- I forgot when it, when it, I think it was the whole month of June. Well, that's it. There's a lot of good stuff there that yes. you should go check Agreed. out for sure. But Kalika Law is a documentarian. He's a cinematographer. Um, he is famous uh, among some circles, I guess, for um, working behind the scenes on Beyonce's Lemonade. Uh, he, he did a lot of that super impressive cinematography um, in her film. And in this um, doc, he is... Um, documenting the culture of Jamaica, which at least is where his grandparents live. I'm not sure if it's where his parents live or not, but there's a conversation he has with his grandfather at one point. Um, And he has this interesting style where he he kind of functions as a photographer first and foremost. He does a lot of shots standing in front of people who are posing for the camera, still uh, posing and like as if they were ready to have like a still picture taken of them. But he has uh, his like high def slow mo camera just kind of floating around them, um, and we're just kind of like taking in this person's essence, this person's image, this person's vibe. Um, and meanwhile while we're looking at these uh, slowed down video footage of people, um, you're hearing those people talking, but the audio and the video are almost never synced up. Uh, That's kind of Kalika Law's trademark thing that he doesn't sync up his video and his audio. There are a couple of small um, portions in Black Mother where where you get like a little snippet of of audio and video at the same time. Um, But these little audio snippets are the people he's interviewing talking about all sorts of things um, about their culture. And this uh, movie is a little it's it's much more um structured than he usually does um he he breaks it up into three chapters and they're they're called trimesters and each trimester kind of has different thematic focuses in it um like there's one where he talks about religion and it it kind of jumps back and forth between people talking about the influence of christianity in jamaica and the influence of uh rastafarian religion in jamaica um there's long sequences about the cuisine Uh, of Jamaica. Um, There are sequences about... Oh gosh, I'm trying to remember at this point. Um, um, There's like a... Isn't there a a long birth sequence as well? It ends with a long birth sequence. So there's kind of a surprise fourth chapter at the end where it goes first trimester, second trimester, third trimester, birth. Um, And I honestly was like really tensing up for the past... Or the last 15 minutes of this thing because I was just ready for him to like show me the full on like science class birthing sequence because throughout this documentary he shows you some some pretty um, gnarly imagery of people who have been disfigured and and things like that and so I was I was ready for that to be a, a difficult watch um, but he actually um, instead kind of poetically symbolically represents it um, by having you listen to the audio of this woman giving birth um, with this um, overhead bird's eye view shot of the ocean waves coming in, coming in, and it almost looks like um, like a heartbeat monitor or something. The um, the the you know the geometric formations that you're seeing in the waves. Um, so if you've seen 
Lemonade, or if you've seen any of Kalika Law's other features, uh, you know that there's there's going to be a lot of moments like that that are really transcendent and and beautiful. And he he has a way of capturing both um, nature and humans in this really like um, a spiritual way. Um, there were moments where I was a little thrown off um, when you have people um, spouting things that I mean. It, from the way that Kalika Love frames it, um, Jamaican culture has a lot of mysticism to it, uh, and there are moments where you hear people sharing um, their their kind of like mystically informed beliefs that sound a little like conspiracy theorist, like a little almost like anti-vaxxer. Like they're, I don't know if you guys saw the interview with Kanye that got uh, released today by Forbes. He's talking about how there's stuff in our toothpaste and there's stuff in our snacks. It's like controlling our mind. And there are moments in Black Mother where people are are sharing some of those thoughts. But uh, Kalika Law is a documentarian, very much takes kind of takes a back seat and lets his speakers say whatever's on their mind, share kind of honestly um, whatever their their beliefs are. Um, but another thing that's uh, kind of unique about him in the way that he like positions himself in relation to his subject is uh, he always... Um, he always seems to, at least from what I can tell, have these like long-standing relationships with the people that he's filming. Like these are not just randos he's pulling off the street. These are these are family members. These are family friends. These are people who um, are live in a neighborhood he's very familiar with. Um, and so it's kind of like Pedro Costa in a way, where Pedro Costa like lives in the slums of Portugal, and he's like presenting people's real life stories but Pedro Costa is always kind of filtering it through this fictional lens and Kalika Law instead is taking the documentary approach but it's like a very impression impressionistic uh, poetic symbolic documentary approach that's really like nothing else out there um, and and I like this a lot it's only 77 minutes there are times where it feels a little bit longer than that um, but it is pretty stunning start to finish um, Zach you've seen this do you have anything else you want to add about it yeah it's been a little bit uh of it's been a little while since i've seen this i went through a lot of uh, again criterion channel added a bunch of his uh work onto their service and so i went through not only his his features but also some of his short films and i really i like him a lot um i i struggled with black mother a little bit because as, as you've described it is very ethereal um where Something like Field Inward and um, and uh, Urban Rashomon is much more like you described. It's it's much more in like that uh, documentarian, almost journalistic. Because I think he kind of qualifies himself as more of like a photojournalist as well. Because he's he's predominantly known for outside of just his filmmaking for his photos. And so, um, what I love about his about his movies especially something like urban rashomon is that as you described like these are people in his neighborhood that he knows and so if another film you know if, if, if it feels like if, if another filmmaker like came into that neighborhood of um you know it, i forgot where he's located in new york but in new york um that's in harlem yeah i'm pretty sure it's in harlem? Yeah. okay um, in Harlem where if they came in and kind of just started doing what he's doing, it would feel somewhat exploitative because they, you, you can clearly tell that a lot of these people that he's talking to have uh, various mental illnesses, have a lot of drug addictions, have a lot of problems. Um, there's one character that throughout, um, I forgot if it's Urban Rashomon or Field Inward that... Um, I'm not gonna say it, guys. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's uh, such a great movie that we cannot say the name of. <laughs> right, it's his best. Um, yeah, but there's but there's a character that like he follows who's like going who's like kind of in and out of a of a homeless shelter and but these are these are also people that he clearly knows and so like there's like this kind of communal relationship that they have where you can tell the subject is at ease also not because of you know that they're they're all like on you know some pedestal like trying to perform for this this camera but it's it's this guy that they know it's their friend and they're in so the conversations seem very natural because it's like if you were hanging out with Kalik Allah and these people um this is the conversation that you would see because there is this kind of naturalism to it but then also he has like this whole um secondary side as you described he he 
he did a, you know a portion of uh, Beyonce's Lemonade, and then something like Black Mother, which is again it's much more ethereal. Um, I I don't know the the I can't remember, and I again I can't remember off the top of my head the firm history that he has with is he from Jamaica? I, it's either his parents or his grandparents lived there. Um, yeah. Okay. But it's not something that I mean. There's a little bit, even though he has a connection, there is still a degree of distance. It's not like when he's in Harlem walking around the streets, um, and so that's so. There's I think that's kind of what threw me off a little bit because, like I said, I watched a bunch of his stuff in a row, and so you lose a little bit of that with Black Mother. But at the same time, I, it's one that I've been thinking about a lot lately, just because the way the way it's kind of engaging with like that spirituality and these, in these various figures, as you described is really kind of moving because um, he's still able to kind of capture that naturalistic spirit. Um, like as you just, I mean, you have these, these, these kind of these people in, in the Island where he's at just kind of spouting this stuff. But at the same time, um, you know, it doesn't, it, it, nothing feels very like the, de- you know, declarative of it. It's not like they're on there kind of using it to, they're not Kanye at Forbes who are just spouting stuff to spout stuff to, you know, make a nice headline. Like they're just people kind of talking, you know, they just, they, this, they, they have a, a certain degree of education. They're just, you know, they don't understand. That's just that this is just their life. And they're kind of just spouting that. And sure it's, it's incorrect, but there is something as you described that when he kind of just sits back and allows them to talk, um, you know, there is something kind of moving about those moments, and uh, it's one that I definitely want to revisit. Um, and if if you have Criterion Channel, I'd recommend checking out a, a lot of his stuff. He's also a really fun follow on Instagram because he puts a lot of his photos there. So, big fan of Click a lot. Yeah, can't wait to see what else he ends up doing in the coming years. Absolutely. Uh, I know if you don't have Criterion, I think you can rent. Uh, Black Mother and maybe his other stuff also, but it's be- mm-hmm. but specifically Black Mother from. Did, um, go ahead, sorry. No, it's either Cinema Guild or Grasshopper. I it's forgot Grasshopper. Which... Okay, Black yeah. Or Grasshopper. Um, does anybody know if he is attached to Beyonce's Blackest King, which is coming out on Disney Plus at the end of the month? Uh, I don't... See, that's the movie I'm interested in on Disney Plus. I don't give a shit yeah. about Hamilton. I want to watch some Beyonce. <laughs> Let me. Uh, let's see. Hold on, I'm looking. Um, he is not, oh, which bummer. is sad, but, but it'll still. probably still be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, cool. Yeah. Again, so Criterion Channel, but also I think Grasshopper has it on their website where you can rent it or whatever. And I think it's worth it. I mean, I, I would recommend checking out, uh, the other, the other feature films are like 60, 70 minutes. They're not super long. Um, I would recommend checking out those as well as some of the shorts first to kind of see if you are in on him. Because, um, but if you are, I would recommend. You know, it's worth paying up to to watch Black Mother wherever you can watch it. So, cool. Well, let's take a quick break, and then we will be back. Uh, let's wait, chat up a little bit. Um, we will be back uh, for part two to talk Imitation of Life. So, uh, stick with us. Hey, Cemetery listeners, Andrew here. During this break in the show, I'd like to mention that Cemetery does want your money. You can give us your money at patreon.com slash cinematary, where you can chip in a small fee of about $5 a month, you know, the price of a fancy coffee, in exchange for shout outs in every episode, the opportunity to choose movies we cover on the show, and bonus episodes every month in which we talk about more movies as well as other miscellaneous stuff. In the past, we've just been humbly asking for you to share the show and engage with us, and we would still love for you to do those things. You can tweet us at Cinematary, send us an email, uh, Z-A-C-H at Cinematary.com, leave us a review on iTunes, all that stuff. But Cemetery has grown a ton in the past few years due to the hard work of a bunch of writers, myself included, who haven't been paid for their labor, which is sadly a pretty normal thing. We record things and write things for free, you listen to and read them for free, and the only people getting paid are like Apple and Google, which is depressing. So if you appreciate what we do, if you feel like there's some sort of value being exchanged here and you'd like more of it, help us normalize paying people by going to patreon.com slash cinematary and chipping in $5 a month. We would truly appreciate it. Thanks for listening. Now let's get back to the show. is love 
without the giving, without love, you're only living an imitation, an imitation of life. Skies above in flaming colors. And we are back with part two of episode 307 of Cinematary. In this part, we will be talking about 1959's Imitation of Life as part of our Young Critics Watch Old Movies series. And uh, he's been here the entire time, but Chad Newsom is here to t- chat with us. Chad, give us a, before we, uh, we dive into the movie, give us a little bit of an idea of your history, not only with this movie and teaching it, but I mean, you... I'll just say, it seems like you're kind of the melodrama expert, so I'll let you kind of lead with that. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is my podcast debut. <laughs> it's, yeah. not, it's not that luxurious. You know, you're sitting in my, in my, you know, in a room on a couch, so it's not that luxurious. You also, you also pay us? Like, uh, Chad's been a patron for several, that's true. several months. Pay, pay for play. This appearance is pay for play. Yeah, there you go. I'm a patron. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I guess a little over, around a decade ago, I wrote my dissertation on Douglas Sirk. So the first time I encountered this film, uh, I wasn't even that concerned with melodrama, as weird as that may sound, since it's Douglas Sirk. Uh, I was um, writing about him, and uh, I was interested in the film initially because it's the culmination of his career. I mean, he made this movie retired somewhat prematurely, um, moved to Switzerland. He was only in his, um, I guess he was just in his late fifties. Um, you know, so he makes this movie, it's his last film. It's the biggest hit of his career. And then that's it for Douglas Sirk. Um, and I guess what really interested me about it at the time was, uh, I had been watching all of his movies and kind of going through them chronologically. And, you know, he worked, uh, consistently with the producer of this film, Ross Hunter. I mean, he's been he made uh, like twenty one or twenty two films at Universal in the nineteen fifties. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like the same producer on most of those movies. Uh, repeatedly worked with the same actors, although he's working with different ones here. Mm-hmm. Um, same crew, cinematographer, set designer, costume designer, stuff like that. Um, and so they just keep kind of one upping themselves throughout the nineteen fifties. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so. Um, I was kind of very interested in just thinking about uh, kind of the Cirque production unit at Universal, and this mm-hmm. is his kind of crowning achievement of that uh, decade that he spent there. Yeah. Well, and, and something that you mentioned when we were talking off mic is that when this came out, it was the it, it was the biggest hit for Universal and still is one of the biggest hits for Universal, correct? Yeah. I've heard different accounts that um, it was the, I think the most common one, I'd have to double check this for accuracy. Is that it was Universal's biggest hit until Jaws? Mm. Wow, that's crazy. Um, yeah, my my little anecdote to add is that I wrote a a story uh, for the newspaper early this year about this this theater in town. It's it's probably the last standing uh, blacks only theater here in Savannah, and the the thing I kind of led in with is that when this movie debuted. Um, like the theater there was just completely sold out. Like the 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 community, the black community around the theater, like all showed up for this movie. They had like their best. Uh, people describe like the women coming in like their church, you know, like their best church Sunday clothes with like the big hats and everything. Like when when Imitation of Life came out in 1959, like this was like the event. Um, and a, and a lot of them, you know, told me that it was because they had you. Know, it was a black leading character you know, pretty much, um, which was something that they weren't used to seeing. They were used to going to see like the Tarzan pictures and the, uh, and the Roy Rogers Westerns and John Wayne Westerns and stuff of that nature. And, um, is this just me being young and ignorant or has imitation of life kind of faded from the canon a little bit? Like I don't hear people reference it when they talk about the, the great movies, well, that's, what they should. Well, that's that, that's kind of, that, no, that's a good point because I think that leads into the other thing I kind of wanted to start with with you, Chad, is that this is something that you teach. You teach at SCAD, the Savannah College of Art and Design. You teach cinema studies. So I know you teach this one as well as the, the original from 1934. Um, I mean, what how, how, do, how do students today respond to 
this movie, which we'll get into, but is is um, I think has a really nuanced, interesting like view on racism. Yeah. Um, so I teach this film at least once a year in a grad seminar I do on melodrama, and so at least with those students, they've been primed by watching yeah, yeah, other yeah. melodramas before because I think. Uh, if your exposure to classic Hollywood is minimal, imitation of life is a lot to take in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Whether it's thematically or just like Lana Turner's performance, which I really want to talk about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, It's just, it's, it's, um, yeah, there's a lot in this film uh, if you're not as familiar with classic Hollywood. Um, but yeah, I think students, um, funnily enough, uh, they tend to be more interested in the 1934 version of the film Mm -hmm. uh, more so than this one and I mean we we can get into this but I think for uh, I somewhat agree with this and I I go back and forth that there's something almost more radical about the 34 version Mm -hmm. uh, coming out of 1934 that uh, the 1959 version is very much um, it's racial politics or of a uh, much different era. <laughs> yeah, it, th- I mean, it's the same because I've seen both of them as well. The, it's it's the same movie, but it's also it's it's engaging with race in two different eras of mm-hmm. America. So yeah, yeah. Um, now that's interesting though because I, I would assume that they might um, link up a little bit more with the the Douglas Sirk version. Um, Andrew, I know that you're a big fan of this, but before we get to you, uh, Miranda, what what did I mean? I've, I know you've seen this before, but what is your um, what are your feelings or thoughts on Imitation of Life? Um, so this was, I think, this was, I had seen uh, Written on the Wind and All That Heaven Allows before this. And I think I initially had trouble just adjusting to Cirque and uh, kind of grappling with what he was doing. And I mean, I don't know, I watched these when I was in college and I just think, honestly, like, I've been thinking about this a lot too lately. I just didn't have enough, uh, I don't know if life experience is the right word, but just kind of... I don't know, advanced intellect to think about, like, I don't know, I guess it's more just life experiences and being out in the world, um, just to kind of see these nuanced things that Cirque does. Um, and Imitation of Life, I, you know, I, I remember watching it at the time and liking it, but I think it was, it, it is a lot to take in. And I think I was just kind of overwhelmed and I thought, you know, that was good and I do want to revisit it. Um, so when I saw we were watch, you guys were watching it for Young Critics, I was like, well, this is the time to revisit it. Um, and I just was so taken. I mean, it's two hours long, but, like, I was invested the entire time. There's no chance to, like, take a breath. Uh, <laughs> and I don't know. I just, I, it's even, like, I was thinking about it last night before, because I watched it at night before I went to bed, and I don't know, it's something I think you can watch over and over, and there's just so many pieces to this film that you, you know, catch, you pick up on um, with each viewing, which I really appreciate. Um, So, I, yeah, I have, like, I wrote down a bunch of notes of, like, just things I noticed, and I don't know. I, it's sad that this was, like, his last film, but I'm glad it was there, so. Um, I don't, I, let's see. I just, I think my biggest thing was, like, um, just how much, like, uh, let's see, everybody's names, I'm bad with names, um, Annie is just, like, holding this whole thing together, and every time you go back to her, it just seems like there's more of a weight, and just, like, bearing down on her, like, and by the end of the movie, of course, she passes away, and it's just, like, frustrating, too, because, like, honestly, like, you know, Lana Turner's character, it's, like, I, I sympathize with her, you know, empathize with her in some ways of, like, wanting to have this career and being an independent woman, but, like, you're putting so much on Annie, and, like, at the end of the day, Lana Turner's problems are not real problems. <laughs> um, so I think just, like, I, I do appreciate that I... you There's no character that you absolutely write off, Um You know, I think there's something to every character that you can empathize with and understand, um, which, I mean, I guess that's life, right? Like, everybody's complex, but... um, There's also no lead character, right? There's, like, four protagonists in this movie. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that... I think you hit on, the like, the one thing that I, I find most interesting about this movie is that it understands the... The, like... 
you could a- you could absolutely make a movie that's you know much more like mainstream. We're dealing with racism, like a you know like a Green Book, where it's just like it's more overtly like you have to like have you know the epithets being used. It's like it has to be like this clearly like we're we're tackling racism in this movie, and this one is much more attuned to like the subtleties uh, of just like the day to day things. You know the stuff that. Um, a lot of people probably don't recognize. I mean, uh, Chad and I, we, we were talking before uh, everybody logged on, but this is absolutely like a movie that you could probably show, like, a, you know, a you know conservative group, and they pro- and they probably would get stuff out of it. Like they would not, they may not clue into everything but they would still be able to enjoy this i mean this is something that i think you could show most people they may not clue into exactly what Cirque's trying to do but it's a movie that a lot of people will watch and enjoy um because it's it's kind of working on all these different wavelengths yeah because for it to be as popular as it was it had to appeal to just like mainstream 1950s white audiences yeah yeah yeah. so it's you know it can be it you know, can only go so far in its its critique. And I think, I mean, for me, the essence of the movie's method is that it dissolves all issues of race and class and gender into a movie about personal relationships, mm-hmm. which is very typical of not just this film, but the way classic Hollywood in general deals with re- real world issues. And the indication being that, like, if these people can work out this problem, be it one of economics or race then it's soft then it can be made okay by the end of the film Mm -hmm. um so i think that helps explain what makes the movie so popular um and the particular scene i always go to as an example of like the method of this movie the way it'll it'll bring up something very critical about race that gets you really thinking and then dissolves it almost immediately and that's the scene when um Sarah Jane is assaulted. Yeah. And there's that hard cut to Laura getting a foot massage. <laughs> so it's like Sarah Jane, you've got like the jazzy music playing. She's crying yeah. in the street. Hard cut to Laura saying, ah, that feels so good. While Annie massages her feet. And it's just the the distinction of that is this I'm sorry, that that um that cut is just such an ironic undercutting. Mm-hmm. And you just see how like superficial Laura is in that moment. And then Annie and Laura get into that conversation where Annie talks about um, her funeral and how she has friends yeah, yeah. and how she belongs to lodges and has church friends. And Laura, who's known her for... At this point, what, like a decade? <laughs> right. It's like, I had no decade. idea. You have friends? <laughs> yes. And then her response back is... she says, you never, you never asked. Is, yeah. yeah. Uh, Miss Laura, you never asked. And again, another like sharp dig. But then the second she says that, like before you as a viewer really have time to think about it, Susie rushes in and says, uh, Sarah Jane, it's Sarah Jane, she's hurt. And they all have to come together and deal with that new problem. Mm -hmm. Um, Same thing happens in smaller moments like uh, uh, when they're young and and Annie says, how do you tell your daughter she's born to be hurt? Mm -hmm. Quickly fade away. Steve arrives. Mm -hmm. So it's like brings up something, but just as you have time to think about it, it brings it down to something about uh, on a personal level. It's about relationships. Yeah. um, As opposed to kind of further exploring. uh, Sure. uh, Kind of harsh reality of the film. This is how people um, experience like the political dimension of life in their real life. Right. And whenever they are faced with some sort of structural injustice, you know, what you want to do is just kind of burn it all down and fix it. But on a practical level, people have their own lives and their own like personal responsibilities to get to that kind of you end up sidelining a lot of that stuff or repressing it or ignoring it um that it seems like this movie is maybe tapping into that as well like none of these characters maybe feel a like feel like they have enough power to change any of these various like power dynamics they're caught in um but they're also like so caught up in their own like web of relationships that it never it never takes central focus yeah Andrew, you reminded me of the uh, the scene where exactly what you're talking about. The uh, scene where um, uh, Sarah Jane does the stunt when the film director comes over, mm-hmm. uh, and she walks out with the crawdads, mm-hmm. and it's just this. Oh God! Kind of yeah. cringe every time you watch that scene. Yeah. Um. And the, but then they go into the kitchen, and I think Sarah Jane says something along the lines of, uh, 
like, Laura, you don't know what it is to be different. And Laura's response is, have I ever treated you differently? Mm-hmm. Basically saying, well, like, I, I mean, she has right. treated her differently. <laughs> um, but she takes it to the personal level. Like, I'm not a personal <laughs> racist, uh, is what Laura is trying to indicate to her. But Sarah Jane is trying to say, that's that's not the issue. Like, you, mm-hmm. how you personally treat me isn't the issue. There are larger, you know, social structures in place that are racist, that are, uh, that those are the real problems. Yeah. Luckily, that doesn't relate at all to anything that we're dealing with in current (laughs) events. Um, Andrew, I'm curious to get your perspective on the movie. I know, I think you're the one who turned me on to this the first time, actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was just, I had rewatched Douglas Sirk's All That Heaven Allows, which um, we did for the podcast several years ago, and just kind of got inspired to check out a couple of his other movies. I remember watching Written on the Wind and, and really liking parts of it, but thinking that, like, God, these characters are so ridiculously privileged, and it feels like this movie maybe doesn't uh, interrogate them hard enough and Dylan was like well you should probably watch Imitation of Life like that's probably the one that you should you should go to next and I watched it and I've now watched it three times this was just like last year um, that I saw it first and when I watch Imitation of Life I feel like the earth is about to collapse in a body stuff like there, there are these scenes where like um God, Laura comes back from the um, the audition where where she uh, gets like sexually propositioned in a really degrading and and disgusting way. Oh, with the and, with the agent. Yeah, and she starts crying in Annie's lap, and Annie asks what's wrong, and she says everything. Um, and then like at the very end of the movie. Um, after Annie has died, uh, you get the scene in the the black church where you have this gospel singer singing, but she's not singing a like um, a, a song that is meant to like give anyone consolation, right? This is not Amazing Grace um, or or anything that's like about God's love for us. It the song is like uh, the trouble of this world, like that's the line that keeps being said again, the trouble of this world, and um, it just. That, that is kind of um, the feeling that I'm left with watching Imitation of Life. Like, we've mostly talked about this movie so far as a movie about racism, but it's a movie about so many types of, like, power imbalances and discrimination, you know? Um, all of these characters, I feel like you could map out each and every scene. Uh, scenes are usually, like, between two people with two different amounts of power and it's like black people and white people men and women uh employers and employees adults and children etc 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 and there's always like it's just kind of like exposing all of these contradictions in american life that are like fundamentally absurd like um uh um sarah jane's character like the tragedy of this character and and we can talk later about like how this kind of intersects with um racist tropes of like the tragic mulatto and and whitewashing and things like that um but like this character her outlook on life is so interesting because unlike every other character in this movie and every other character in most movies she sees like this web of contradictions in america for what it is like she sees racism and like the difference the the difference different way in which she is treated as a mixed race woman as like fundamentally absurd like she's kind of like rattling the cage of existence like why why was i born like born into this world where i was born to be hurt she like doesn't get it because it doesn't make any sense um i doing like a a cursory amount of of research on douglas sirk maybe uh, you could speak more to this chad but like my understanding is that he like left nazi germany like he fled from nazi germany is that right uh Eventually, <laughs> he worked. He worked in. He stayed until the mid thirty or maybe thirty seven. Mm. Still working at a uh, Ufa in Germany, um, which is somewhat still controversial. That he, you know, like people like um, I don't know, Fritz Lang, Lubitsch, yeah, uh, Murnau, Murnau. Yeah, yeah, got out really early. Uh, yeah. He stayed for a while. <laughs> It, they were out. I mean, there was a lot yeah. more jobs. Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. know enough about his German career, but well, I, I'd be curious to hear like what the 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 con case is there. Like, why why people kind of 
doubt um, Douglas Sirk's integrity or like opposition to fascism because from this movie it just feels like he's seeing the hierarchical nature of like the Nazi ideology in every aspect of American life and never like talks about that directly like this is not Starship Troopers where somebody walks out in like an SS uniform at any point but it is like it feels to me like it is ripping apart American culture in the same way you would rip apart a movie about 1930s Germany. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, Chad, what is the what is the context there and what's the the discourse about Douglas Sirk around his work in Germany? I I'm not as informed about that. Um, I do know. I'm not exactly sure why he stayed as long as he did. I do know he was involved in like kind of leftist theater mm-hmm. in the 1920s, I believe. Um, oh, with like Max Reinhardt. In this I way? know he staged like Brecht plays, for oh, example. Okay. Um, so he has this like leftist intellectual background. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that helps account for the tone of some of his movies. Cause you can imagine being given, you know, some of these more soap opera esque Mm-hmm. Hollywood movies that were considered at the time to just be like trashy soap operas and to come at it from like this kind of on the left intellectual position. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why, uh, I mean, the key thing I think about Cirque is um, the word that's usually used to describe that come, pops up in discussions of his movies is distanciation. Um, that there's, I have never heard this word before. That there's um, a degree of, this kind of alternation of kind of empathy and feeling closeness towards the characters, but being distanced as well. Mm -hmm. Um, So the big stylistic detail that's always highlighted here is his use of mirrors. Um, Mm -hmm. The way that people are always um, that he's uh, um, kind of uses mirrors within the mise-en-scene and people are framed and looking at their reflections. There's always doubles. Um, It's very German. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I mean, he kind of came up in the expressionist era. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, even even like we talked about it in All That Heaven Allows, but it, it, rather than a like physical mirror, something like a TV screen is utilized. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the big turning point with Cirque, though, is when he's actually making these movies. Um, like if you go and read reviews of uh, Imitation of Life, they're bad. Uh, he was not taken seriously as a director the way, say, Chaplin or Hitchcock was taken seriously. Mm -hmm. Um, They were considered just, yeah, just kind of trashy movies. (laughs) Um, My favorite is Time Called Imitation of Life, A Potent Onion. (laughs) 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 It um, It has layers. (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, But the big turning point with Douglas Sirk is that in, he's kind of like, the discipline, the academic discipline of film studies, he's like film studies first discovery. Mm-hmm. So like his film studies moved away from auteurism and became more ideologically oriented in the 1970s. Everyone latched on to Cirque because he had this background and like leftist theater. Mm-hmm. But also um, in 1971, this book of interviews was published with him. This book of interviews was published called by John Halliday called Cirque on Cirque. Mm-hmm. And like, Cirque, who had never been taken seriously when he was actually working, all of a sudden recast his whole career as I was a critic. I was a critic of like Americans, of like bourgeois American society. Yeah. And that just like feeds right into what film scholars at that time were looking for. Uh-huh. And of course, those movies are filled with that. I mean, I mean, Imitation of Life, I think one of the reasons why people return to it so often is, I mean, you get, um, uh, you know, it's got this symbolically rich mise en scène. It's a stars born story. You get class, you get race, you get gender. Mm-hmm. Like whatever you're interested in film wise, this connects with with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was very ver- he was very well versed in um, uh, like film theory. Um, mm-hmm. And that, that's really interesting because I always feel like the the intro of that was the Truffaut Hitchcock interviews is like the kind of uh, reexamining a director's work. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's kind of that's inter- I didn't realize that he was kind of the first one. Yeah, I think having a like a political ideological edge, mm. and not just like with um, the more traditional auteurism is just you have a recurring personal style. This is more Cirque was more like I'm stylistically consistent, and I have a like a political agenda, 
And I was kind of taking money from the studios and inserting these things into my movies to, um, you know, uh, kind of undermine the stories in some way. Mm. The, um, so yeah, um, viewing Cirque's movies as ironic, which I don't necessarily think they are. I would disagree with that as a, an overall reading of his work. But words like irony, um, distance, or distanciation are the words usually associated in critical circles with thinking about Cirque. Hmm. No, that's interesting. What's the ironic reading of Imitation of Life? Um, I... I a potent on- onion, clearly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, um... For me... I mean, one of the scene I have to think about individual scenes, I guess. Um, that uh, the one, I mean, the one I mentioned earlier was the the cut between um, Sarah Jane's assault and then uh, Annie getting the foot massage. Um, but there, where you get uh, this kind of undercutting of what the movie's doing, kind of the moment that draws your attention and makes you think slightly more critically. Uh, there's the moment where. Um, Sarah, when they're young and Sarah Jane's been passing at school mm-hmm. and you get that kind of really dramatic scene outside with the red, big red fire hydrant. Uh, and then it immediately cuts to um, Laura pulling a thermometer out of Susie's mouth and saying, why wow, you're practically normal. <laughs> um, then uh, um, there's the scene where they're discussing the, um, how Laura wants to start doing more serious plays yeah. and wants to do a movie that has like a race angle in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, the director or the producer is talking about how stupid and like foolish it would be to do that. And then it cuts, you get a reaction shot of Annie in the background who's making that really quick yeah. too. It's like a yeah. second. Um, yeah. Well, I think that's a good, a good, uh, or this is a good point to kind of talk a little bit more about Lana Turner's performance. Um, because I, I think I was a little, I was a lot more clued in, or not clued in, but I I, I I kind of got a little bit more out of it this last viewing, um, just how completely, you know, delusion she is from anything else happening outside of her, her own little bubble of space. <laughs> um, Mir- Miranda, what did you make of, of that central performance by her? I agree. Um, again, like I said, I, you know, fell, you know, for her and like, had you know understood her position of wanting to like you know become a star um again in some ways though it just seemed like trivial too like it seems like okay well he doesn't want to become an actress but um from that aside like i think for me as the movie goes on she becomes more and more self-absorbed um but yeah i um i don't know i i liked her performance i I think it's a nice contrast to um, uh, the woman who plays Annie. Um, they just seem so different, too. Yeah, we need a more. Thank you. Um, but, um, you know, and I like I guess I had said before, she just, I don't know, she just seems so self-absorbed. And, you know, even not just like with, you know, with her relationship with Annie and uh, Sarah Jane, but even with her own daughter. Um, not even being able to tell that she's in love with somebody. I, um, so I don't know. seems like so much of the performance also is tied up in the costuming, um, and like the accessorizing of this, um, of this actor, uh, in the opening credits, there, there, there are lines crediting the people who made specifically her costumes and people who provided specifically her jewelry. Um, the, the like gaudiness of the character is like a kind of a spectacular thing to see on screen, but it also um, it's, it's being used here for that, um, that like critiquing effect of her like self-absorption and her like not being able to see past her own personal interests. Uh, Maybe you don't know Chad, but is there any, I mean, I, I don't know how like big or small of a star Lana Turner was at this time, but was there any is there any kind of parallel between um, her starring in this movie and kind of that the scene that you described earlier, where it's like the the actress wanting to be taken a little bit more seriously, and so she take she tackles the the quote unquote race film. Yes. <laughs> okay. Cool. <laughs> I have I have one comment, and then I have a good story. Okay. <laughs> um, 
this just re- so going back to Andrew's question earlier about like what is distance or what is distanciation in this film um I think the the split between how we read Laura's character versus Annie kind of summarizes that split between like irony and sincerity and distance and empathy um because I think it's more it's it's easier to uh, you know, truly feel like the pain that Annie feels in this film. All the, all the, um, like you empathize with her suffering, right? Whereas with Lana Turner, like there's something about her performance style and and other movies, but it's something in the way she's directed here is she's always consciously performing, and it and attention is drawn to that throughout the movie. So you always, and it creates a degree of distance. Yeah. Her daughter says, stop acting yes, at one and point. And she is, when you rewatch it, notice when she's acting, she kind of looks straight ahead and lifts her chin, lifts her head a bit. <laughs> and like she does that the first time, for example, that she meets Annie and starts talking to her. Um, but even from the very first, our introduction to her, mm-hmm. she's, you know, going along the boardwalk and she leans out. Yeah. And later on, we find out that's become a pose yeah. that Steve has taken. Yeah. And she's playing the like distressed mother. And then lo and behold, the photo title is the distressed mother. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so she's very much like consciously p- performing from the very beginning. Um, and so to me, that creates this degree of distance because she always seems to be acting. Then like the extra layer, and this is the, the good story that I mentioned, um, like outside of this movie this movie um so she was dating a gangster named johnny stampanato which, yes. great name. <laughs> okay. <laughs> which if you're gonna be a gangster that's a great gangster name Jumpy, yeah. and it's like stomp s-t-o s-t-o-m-p johnny stampanato <laughs> and um so while so she has a daughter in real life Lana Turner had a daughter Lana Turner is I think 39 when this movie comes out Mm -hmm. um, or she's making it she has a this is late career Lana Turner she has a daughter named Cheryl who's 15 and um, Cheryl is Susie Uh, they even filmed at Lana Turner's the real life school where her Lana Turner's real daughter went so everything about like the working mother, the working actress who neglects her daughter and her daughter just wants her love. That was really close to home for Lana Turner's daughter. So um, in April of 1958, and this is during the filming of Imitation of Life, um, Johnny Stampanato and Lana Turner are having a fight. And uh, Cheryl, her daughter, overhears this. um, And supposedly... Uh, Johnny uh, lunged at Cheryl and she grabbed a knife and she stabbed him in the chest and she killed him. Uh, so this happens while Imitation of Life is being made. And, imita- and Imitation of Life was the first film to come out after Lana Turner's boyfriend was killed by Lana Turner's daughter. And so the publicity kind of cashes in on that. But everything about like the neglected daughter, mother-daughter strife, the romantic rivalry between mother and daughter in and, and real life, and then Steve in the film. This was like tabloid fodder for people watching this movie in the time period. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just disappointed that Ash isn't on this episode to hear the name Johnny Stoppin. <laughs> <laughs> they would have loved that. <laughs> um, well, I, I think it's also worth... Uh, talking a little bit about, you know, in terms of performances, I think uh, the the thing that's always struck me about Juanita Moore's performance as Annie is just how, as you described it, like, you, ha- you, you do have, like, this empathy for this character, but at the same time, she plays it so well as, like, I don't know what the, the best way to describe it, but she plays it so well as, th- I'm going to be just black enough for you white people to make you comfortable <laughs> you know like that's I, it, she she kind of she, that performance just kind of feels like that like she you know like you, like in the scene you described where she's talking about you know i i want this this massive funeral i have these friends like she she clearly has like this this fully realized life outside of just the moments that we're watching which also kind of plays with just your perception of like 
um, of just like movies in general, like because you know if if this was like a novel or something, you probably would have kind of like a, a you would you would kind of go off and and kind of explore that side of Annie and then come back or something, um, and that's what I kind of find so interesting about this because you give. She she does have this full life, but you're completely in the POV of uh, of Laura, and, and and so you're unable to ever really kind of engage in that until the very end. And so, but I find the performance to be so really so moving and tragic at times. I mean that the the her final her her kind of final meeting moment with with Sarah Jane is just um is just really tragic and, and oh, sad. Oh God, yeah. And uh, yeah, the, can I, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Chad. Um, I think one of the things that's uh, that happens in the fifty nine version that you don't get in the thirty four is, in the, and this goes back to what we were talking about earlier about issues of race, like everything being reduced to a very personal level. Is the employer employee relationship is really masked in this mm-hmm. film as friendship? Like right. in the thirty four version, she is she is hired as a maid, and yeah. here it's just like I'm just going to stay one night. And then Laura wakes up, and she's, like, taking care of the kids already and tidying the kitchen. She has her laundry done. Yeah, she has her laundry <laughs> done, and she says uh, that line, like, oh, I just like nice things. Like, everything is seen uh, to be, like, like done I out like, of... What is it? I like I like, pr- like messing with ne- nice things or something along that line. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then at one point, Laura offers to pay her, um, and she says, no, we're we are going to save this as like you and me together are going to put this in our savings. Uh, we now have like one shared bank account now. So it's, it's kind of unclear um, in this movie. Like if we're just looking at this movie as its own text, like if that even is an employer employee relationship, but of, of course it is in the, the earlier versions. Yeah. And um, this is a line. I mean, I've seen this movie a lot of times and I've never caught this line before. Um, where she, Annie says she's take she's doing like, like pressing someone's shirts Mm -hmm. so that she can have some money. So it's like, she's taking, she's raising, she's raising Susie and Sarah Jane and taking care of the house. Yeah. And then she is doing the stairwell to get a discount on rent. Yeah. Yeah. And then she's, she's doing the envelopes. She's doing Laura's other job for her of like addressing the envelopes. Yeah. And then then to actually make money, she's also uh, doing laundry for someone else so she can make money. So it's like her workload is incredible. Yeah. Uh, but again, it's all that all that labor is disguised as friendship. It's made invisible. It's kept in the background. And that's, I think, one of the things that makes the finale of the film so powerful is that um, – her, her whole life that's been obscured is now on display, mm-hmm. right? That the frame is filled um, with her community, the people that go to her lodges and churches. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, um, uh, Sarah, I'm sorry, uh, Laura and Susie are in the minority in that in yeah. that crowd. Yeah, they have the shot, the close-up on the, the, the theater producer and her agent, but that's about it. Right, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I will say the... <laughs> it's... You wouldn't think anybody would be anti Annie, uh, but you should look up a uh, Fassbender, uh, who is very influenced by Cirque. Um, he refers to uh, Annie as a brutal emotional terrorist. Is his description what? of Annie what? that her love was oh her, that goodness. her love was too much? Uh, he likes the movie, but it's the oh, only God. like really negative thing I've ever heard said, and it's oh, I mean God. it's a really hyperbolic way of of, of, of of putting it. <laughs> Uh, well i i mean i can't imagine serious critiques of this movie on racial grounds because it has these three um normally racist tropes that it dabbles in it has the tragic mulatto character with sarah jane it has the mammy character and they they use that word like drawing reference to gone to the wind several several times when talking about annie and then you also have the issue of like uh studio whitewashing where the character playing sarah jane is not actually half black um but and so 
all three of these things together is, are kind of like a recipe for the most problematic movie of all time. But I mean, at least to me, it feels like Cirque is employing these things in about the most profound way possible. Um, but Chad, I'm kind of curious how, like, how you have, um, how you think about this as like someone who's gone back to this movie several times on an academic basis. Yeah, I guess I'm. I, mean, I guess I'm always comparing this to the, like I said earlier, to the 1934 version, um, which uh, I think is, um, its racism is more overt, but its progressive moments are more progressive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the 34 version, um, and I think, I mean, and um, the character of Sarah Jane is named Piola in that film, and is played by a black actor named Freddie Washington, who um, something that adds an, an extra layer to the film. Uh, that it kind of indexes or documents the kind of experiences with um, that that the actual actress would have gone through in real life of mm-hmm. feeling pressured to pass, for example, as white. Um, but I, yeah, I think that um, again, to me, the emphasis on the personal kind of blunts the progressiveness of the film. Um, that. Uh, there's a great article called um, by a film scholar named Marina Hung called um, "What's the Matter with Sarah Jane," and she argues in that essay that uh, what the film do- what what makes the film safe kind of for a mass audience in the time period is that uh, it makes Laura into a bad mother and Sarah Jane into a bad daughter. And so you can kind of it gives you an out to dismiss the real criticisms that Sarah Jane brings up because of how she treats her mother in the film. Mm-hmm. Um, and that the film, Hung's argument is that the film makes the mother and makes mo- makes antagonists out of mother and daughter, as opposed to two black women versus a racist culture, mm-hmm. um, which is, I think, a, a, a I don't know, an argument that I definitely uh, buy into in thinking about that movie. Mm-hmm. Andrew, Miranda, any any thoughts on that? Um, I'm not I'm not sure. I'm still processing. Miranda, you have anything? Not. I mean, that was something I thought about too. I mean. Uh, conflicts, you know, between mother and daughter, I mean, for both of them, like this idea of, you know, I think at one point Annie and Laura are talking and they're saying, you know, no matter how we raised, you know, our daughters, like we still have this conflict and it, you know, what maybe we, it could be argued, but we were bad mothers. Um, and that's, and like I said, this is a movie, I, I definitely need like at least two re- two watches to like, have like a fully you know well thought out idea but that's just something i was thinking about too yesterday um and i would like to, after talking about laura and just you know how much you know just her her or lana turner's performance and um just how sub, self-absorbed she is like something i'd like to look go like watch again and you know pay more attention to yeah and the reading of it being i need to read this essay by the way but the um, the reading of those characters being cast as bad mothers and bad daughters it's hard for me to put myself in the place of someone who would take that reading away from it because i guess i'm so primed to like abstract this stuff out and think about it in terms of like class conflict and racial conflict and like thinking about you know we of course we're going to have characters with unique personalities and and human lives but they're they're kind of in many cases stand-ins for these larger structural conflicts Uh, but i i could definitely see um somebody who has more of like a personal responsibility mindset um watching a movie like this and coming away with that idea that these people just need to just be nicer to each other uh because like the movie does leave room for that reading um but that's like so not where my head is at when I'm watching Imitation of Life. Yeah, and um, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's why this movie is like such a perennial critical object because it allows for so many different readings depending on you know thinking about how audiences at the time would respond, how it's changed since then, how we watch it today, um, and then you know uh, Sarah Jane. I mean, I one of the ironic things about Sarah Jane is you you can think of her whole life is a kind of inversion of laura right she's looked up for laura from the beginning as this like white mother Mm -hmm. sarah jane identifies with her white it's not really indicated i think whether her father is white he just was 
I guess very light skinned. I think it's how, well. No, I think that's Annie said at, at one point. Um, yeah. Practically white. Yeah, okay. is what she says. Um, yeah. You know, and she even there's that moment, that kind of weird line delivery where um, they're talking about Jesus, and, <laughs> and Sarah Jane's yeah. like, "He's oh white God. like me." <laughs> um, so she identifies with like these like, I mean, Lana Turner is just like white dress, blonde hair, jewels, like right. white on white on white, kind of both racially and, um, you know, how she's presented in the film. But then she identifies with like uh, Jesus as a white man and with her father, who's no longer around. And in the end of the movie, you know, and then she, mo- well, backing up a second, she gets, she kind of models her career off of, uh, she's kind of like a lower grade version of Laura, right? She's doing mm. these kind of burlesque style nightclub performances, whereas Laura's, you know, has the more successful entertainment career Mm -hmm. and then at the end of the movie despite her mother dying that the i think that last shot of them together in the in the limousine like sarah jane gets what she wants right it's this image of a nuclear family you've got Mm -hmm. this like quote unquote white family together um all Mm -hmm. riding away in the car you've got got, (laughs) she's got steve now (laughs) you know there's Susie and laura they're all back together again her mother is out of the picture so she never has to um you know deal as her only family so now she has the white family that she's (laughs) desired all along (laughs) (laughs) Um, randy you ready to say something yeah, that also there's that shot. Um, you know, it seems to kind of echo in the beginning of the movie where Steve comes home. Well, okay, so there, he is coming into the apartment, and you know they just met him, and he has the pictures, and Sarah Jane and uh, uh, Susie run up to him and like act like he's her their dad, and you know it seems very much like a you know a family affair, and like I don't think Annie's in that shot, like when he's coming down the hall. So it kind of seems to echo that. But yeah, in this case, like you said, Annie's gone and Sarah mm-hmm. Jane has what she wanted. No, it's, which, it's just a super know. fucked up point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is. It is. I agree. But I, like, as I remember watching that and I'm like, oh, I don't know how I feel about this. And then, yeah, it goes. It's gone pretty quick. So I don't know. Um, any any closing thoughts on Imitation of Life before we wrap up? It's really good. I mean, if people if people haven't seen Imitation of Life, <laughs> they should see Imitation of Life. Um, I mean, probably. Unfortunately, it's not streaming yeah, anywhere. That sucks. Um, you, you may have to just just buy it. You know, it's worth it. You you also get the twenties version too if you if you want to watch that in the Blu-ray. Uh, no, I don't think other anything other than yeah, definitely go watch it if you you know. <laughs> Chad, any um, I guess as as for you closing, any any kind of Douglas Sirk recommendations for for people who maybe have seen this, liked it, or um, kind of want to explore him a little more? Any any other Sirk or just melodrama in general recommendations? Uh, yeah, I um, I mean my my favorite film is All That Heaven Allows, so I can't mm-hmm. recommend that enough. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't know if that was your first. If that was the first Cirque, I don't know how people would respond to that. Um, that was mine. It yeah. was okay. 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 It I loved ours. it, so we're good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but I think he is. Um, <laughs> I mean, his skill as like his auteurist skill is that he's a great director of women in particular, mm-hmm. uh, and especially women who are at. Um, a later stage in their career. It sounds weird to say it's like Lana Turner's only 39, mm-hmm. <laughs> but that's like late career for her. The same yeah. Th- but he works in the fifties with, um, uh, Claudette Colbert mm-hmm. with Barbara Stanwyck yeah. twice with Jane Wyman twice. Yeah. Um, so all that heaven allows, um, his two Stanwyck films are incredible. Um, all I desire. And there's always tomorrow. Um, and of course he does, he's, um, his Cirque's stardom uh, corresponds with uh, Rock Hudson as well, which is mm-hmm. Rock Hudson's and, and All That Heaven Allows. Um, but they did a lot of... Um, they did quite a few movies together. There's one called... Has anybody seen My Gal that I really like? Mm. Um, and they, they did some... Cirque's universal career is kind of weird because I mean his first movie at Universal is called Mystery Submarine <laughs> so it's like to go from 1950s Mystery Submarine to Imitation of Life just shows you uh, a little under a decade right to show I mean, but that's kind of the genius of the studio system right that you're just he made three movies almost every single year 
oftentimes working with the exact same people film after film. So it's mm-hmm. just, that's what the studio system did best is it gave you this kind of uh, apprenticeship process uh, where you just, you worked so much, you became gr- you could become great in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, even though he's got an independent career, a career at Columbia in the 40s, um, when he first came to the U.S., he uh, he was out of work, and I think he was like a, uh, I think he raised chickens. He was some kind of farmer. Um, but yeah, there's all these different phases. Like, you can watch his German phase, you can watch his indie phase in the 40s, his Columbia phase, and then the Universal Pictures as well. <laughs> Very cool. Um, sorry, I'm trying to pull up our patron page so I can say all the patron stuff in a second. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I believe that will wrap up this episode of Cinematary. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash cinematary, on Twitter and Instagram at uh, handle at cinematary, and on Letterboxd, letterboxd.com slash cinematary, where we post all the episode or all the uh, movies that we talked about in this episode. And I just pulled it up, so we're good. Um, and check out patreon.com slash cinematary. Um, uh, Chad, I'm not going to say your name because you're sitting right here. It seems weird. Um, yeah, that's, 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 instead of a, a name shout for this episode, you just get to be on the episode. I, I guess. know. That's like the top tier, right? I get to actually be here in person. Yeah. <laughs> an all-expenses paid trip to Savannah to record. With you Zach get an all-expense <laughs> paid trip to West Bolton Street where you get to sit with me and drink a water. <laughs> Um, patri- <laughs> thank you to our patrons Cam, Christina Daughtry, Cindy Roberts Harry Eskin, Hell Yeah Small World Joe Jordan, Maggie, Matthew Lingo Pedro Seraphim, Ron Hayes The Kittiest of Kittens Titus Arthur, Tyler Chandler, and Whitney Rhea Ross Thank you so much for your patronage We have a new Film Theory and Chill up there If you would like to, uh, to check it out we'll, we'll hopefully have some more Nice patron goodies coming up very soon. But we'll continue our Young Critics Watch Old Movie series next week with 1957's The Seventh Seal, which I'm kind of excited to watch. I've never seen this one. And uh, we have the late Max von Sydow in it. So uh, should be a should be an interesting conversation. And, and it's kind of crazy. If you have not been keeping up, we're about halfway through our Young Critics series. So... Um, we have some really good stuff coming up in the coming weeks. By the way, I am I am very excited for. Yeah, a lot we of got some episodes. bangers coming up. But uh, if you've if you've not if you've <laughs> not you know listened to the the series you know at large, I would I would recommend going back and checking out a bunch of them. So we've had some uh, good episodes so far with some good guests. So um, yeah, thanks so much, Chad, for coming in. Yeah, thanks. This was great. All right, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.